welcome and Merry Christmas to everyone. And you notice the tie that I'm wearing today, and uh, it's got snowmen on it, and there is no snow here in Tennessee. In fact, we're supposed to hit the 70s today, 75 degrees tomorrow, which is unusually warm for us here in, in Tennessee, for those who aren't from around here. And uh, let's begin with class of the prayer, and then I'm going to make some announcements. So, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come and study. We ask that your spirit will join us. We ask that your angels will watch over us. We ask that we'll draw together in the love that you've designed for us. We pray in your holy name. Amen. And most of you are familiar with this book, okay? But this is the same book you probably haven't seen in German. And I'm showing this to you because... Oh, five, six years ago or so, this book came out in Germany, and some people read it in German, and they called me or emailed me and asked if I would come over and do some programs, and Christy and I went over to do some programs and met my friends who are here from Germany, and they're in the back. They go ahead and stand up, guys. Go ahead and stand up. Okay. This is, uh, yeah, they're here from Aachen, Germany, and uh, they are like family, and that's, and uh, little girl there, Noah, that's my patenkind, and, uh, which means she's my goddaughter. And, um, and her name's Noah, and we are so glad you guys are here today. Yes, yes. Well, thank you all for coming. And we've had a, a fantastic time with them. The, they arrived here on Christmas Eve from, from Germany, and they will be here um, heading back, I guess, in another week or so. so. But they will be in a conference in Louisville next Sabbath. So if you want to visit with them, say hi to them today. <laughs> and then I also want to make an announcement for anybody who has a, a business with a waiting room. If you have a business with a waiting room where people wait, we now have these available, a little sticker inside and a little sticker inside here, that we will provide these at no cost to put in your waiting room. If you want to put one of these in your waiting room somewhere, let us know if you're in the U.S. We will ship this to you at no cost. Just email us at requests at come and reason. Or if you guys have one here today, I'll send one with you if you want. So I've got the stickers. <laughs> All righty, we are doing um, lesson number two in the quarterly, Rebellion and Redemption, and the uh, title this week is Crisis in Eden, and the memory text is Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. What does this mean? We've all heard it multiple times, many, many times. What is God actually doing? Did you ever think about this? Is God acting to cause division, discord, disunity. Well, the key is to ask between what? What are Satan's principles? This and, is survival. <laughs> okay, and what are Satan's principles result in? Selfish. Yeah. Ruin and death. Yeah. Then what action would God take to cause enmity? Rescue. Yeah, it, yes, exactly. It means God is instilling love, kindness, peace, grace, forgiveness, mercy, gentleness, goodness, honesty, truthfulness, selflessness. God is working in the hearts of men to instill these virtues. And when these virtues are instilled in the hearts of sinners, it actually causes a division between those who have a different principle, selfishness, exploitation, deceit, hostility, um, so forth. Therefore, these principles cause a separateness or a division between the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of God. God is working to instill in us a desire for something better. And I'm wondering, as you read that, did any New Testament text pop into your mind? Jesus speaking, for instance. Matthew 20, 34 through 36, Jesus said, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be members of his own household. Now, have you ever read that and wondered, Man, what in the world is that? What, what is Jesus talking about? He's going to turn families against each other? I thought he was be, we're to be the family of God. He's going to unite us. What does this mean that he's going to come and, and divide families? Did anybody ever read that and get troubled by that? Yeah. So this is from the remedy. If you haven't downloaded the remedy, this is that same verse. See if it kind of puts a little insight onto that. Don't think that I've come to make peace with a selfish world. I've not come to bring peace with selfishness, but a sword to cut selfishness out of the hearts of men. I've come to cut dysfunctional family ties, 
to free a son from the selfish loyalty to his father's ambitions and feuds, to sever a daughter from the control of an oppressive and manipulative mother, to cut through the fear and hostility a daughter-in-law has toward a mother-in-law. A person's worst enemies are often members of their own family. Any thoughts about that? You see, you know, I've obviously added a little bit to kind of clarify that rather than just I've come to bring a sword. But it really, the way you, under, you have to understand what principles, what method, a sword of what? The sword of truth, the sword of love to cut through what? Lies and deceit and self-centeredness in the hearts of men. Second paragraph says, how did we get into this situation? The answer is found in the great controversy which, though beginning in heaven, had unfortunately come to earth and fairly early on in earth's history too. What do you think the phrase fairly early on in earth's history means? Is this speaking of the early in regards to the non-living matter on earth when that was made or when life was made on earth? What, what do you think it's referring to? Or is there a difference? Isn't it the reason for earth's history? I didn't follow that. The great controversy. The earth, I don't think, would have been necessary if the allegations had not been made and the evidence was not necessary. That's an interesting... The, the way you said that is just interesting. If I think about some other... You know, Ellen White talks about the plan to create earth that had already been in the works prior to the rebellion, and then God went forward with this plan. Yes, it was part of the answer, no question about it, but would God have created an earth like this anyway in part of his grand design because he loves beings in his image and loves to do this? I don't know. Um, certainly, I don't disagree that this was part of the answer, no question. I guess the question I was kind of probing is, do you see this idea, this idea early on in earth's history, is earth having a history the inanimate materials, the, the bedrocks, the geological formations, so to speak, the matter that is inorganic in nature, non-living in nature, does it have an existence prior to the Genesis 1 account? Or do you see Genesis 1 describing the actual creation of the inanimate materials on earth? Well, Job 38, 4 through 6 says that the angels sang together for joy when the foundations of the earth were laid, and it asked the question of Job, where were you? Think through the meaning of that. Okay, the, the angels were already in existence when earth was created, if you believe Job's account, the account of Job, the book of Job, which means that there was some creation prior to the foundation of earth that was going on. Hmm. And then Genesis 1 itself, verse 2 says, Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered on the waters. It's, does, does it sound like there was nothing there or something of some voidless, formless substance was there? I think it's very interesting. Job did not answer the question. In other words, Job wanted to talk to God. And finally... Job, uh, God says, okay, you can talk to me, but before, where were you? And he begins to list a series of events for several chapters. When he gets done, Job has the wisdom not to try to tell God how or where or what. He accepts God as God, and that is it. Yeah, and so the question, was, was earth laid, the foundations laid, uh, the Genesis 1 account, or was there some inorganic... What difference does it make? Well, that's a good question. What difference does it make? Does it make a difference at all? It does, it does make a difference with some of the evidence that is provided by... Well, some of the things are taken as evidence for evolution. There you go. This is, does make a huge difference. See, today in our world, what's the evidence that is often put forward? Geological evidence of what? Age of rocks. The age of rocks. And what is the age of rocks in, in the, as far as the radioactive decay of rocks and so forth? Billions of years old. Billions of years. The universe itself, billions of years old. Does Genesis actually describe the creation of the universe? No. It does not. No. The universe was created sometime who knows when. The Bible does not tell us when God made angels. 
The Bible does not tell us when he created the entire universe. It doesn't tell us that information. It tells us in Genesis the creation of Earth and the solar system. Thus, when scientists find geological formations that are dated to billions of years old, you don't have to be threatened with your biblical narrative. The biblical narrative is not threatened by that. The biblical narrative is still true because the Bible is even given information in the Bible that the Earth, the, the, the universe was made sometimes. The answer. But Genesis is the, the story of terraforming a small little section of the Milky Way, our solar system. And if you get your mind around that, you go, okay, wait a second. What about then, um, you know, Genesis 1, 14 through 19, when it says, let there be lights in the sky and so forth, and it says, let the sun, moon, and stars are made. What are you talking about? Most likely, the consistent evidence here is he's talking about Venus and Mars, the stars, the stars, the bright stars in the night of this solar system. This is what he's probably talking about here, not the entire universe again, which was created sometime who knows when. And so we have God who created a universe Things were unfolding in the universe, sometime downstream of already having intelligent life in other places in the universe. God came to this little corner of the Milky Way and terraformed planet Earth after a war had already broken out in heaven over God's trusted worthiness. So I find that when you put those pieces together, we can have a, a, an intelligent conversation with people who point to scientific evidence of the Earth being billions of years old. There's no problem with that. But you can't they can't actually show you scientific evidence that life is billions of years old. That is a, that, there's no evidence for that. That's all theoretical. The w most they can date life with the tools that they have now, and this is all based on assumptions that are not provable, would be 50,000 years. And that's still based on assumptions that are not provable. Sunday's lesson, fourth paragraph, it says, uh, Humans share with fish and birds the divine encouragement to be fruitful and multiply, but the difference comes when Adam and Eve were given the responsibility to care for the earth and all its creatures. Here we see a glimpse of the significance of being created in God's image. The creator invited our first parents to be co-regents with him to uphold and care for the created realm. Any thoughts why the authors chose this, this word encouragement? I just found that an interesting word. I don't necessarily disagree with it. I just found it interesting that that they chose the word encouragement to be fruitful and multiply. As you read it, did, did God say, Adam and Eve, I encourage you to be fruitful and multiply? Or was there just kind of a direct, be fruitful and multiply? Sounds like a command. Well, I was wondering, was there, was there a different directive in, in, in the, the expression of be fruitful and multiply as remember the Sabbath to keep it holy? Is there a different? Or is that just an encouragement? I encourage you not to murder. I encourage you not to murder. I'm just curious about this. Yeah. Um, is it an encouragement when you see these instructions? Be fruitful and multiply. Encouragement? An instruction. Permission. Directive. Command. Description. Mission statement. Gift. Intention. How do you hear that? Instruction. Be fruitful and multiply. How do you uh, take the comment, fill the earth, Fill the earth. Be fruitful and multiply. And fill the earth. Fill the earth. Some people apparently think that it's their duty to fill the earth. Yeah. So do you take that as an encouragement, a, a, an instruction, a directive, a command, um, a suggestion? Uh, uh, Russell. And, and kind of in harmony or in, in line with what uh, he just said, um, after the fall, God tells Eve, your conception will be increased and your pains with conception will be increased. Mm -hmm. So it is, did God intend for there to be 7 billion people on the planet? You know, I, I don't know that we have a, a number right. in, in, involved there. I don't know. But what lesson, it was brought up earlier by Lori about the idea that earth was created to reveal something. What lesson was the earth created to reveal? How do all things, this is a trick question almost, unless you really pause for a moment, but how do all things on earth, all living things, on all, all living creatures, look at this, all living creatures on earth reproduce, whether it's sexual or asexual, what's the common underlying denominator that all of them do? Love. Pardon? Love. Love, okay, love, and not as an emotion, but as a 
Actually, they give of themselves. There you go, every one of them. Whether we're talking about mammals or reptiles or birds or helminths or plants or fungi or, or bacteria or amoeba, and when they reproduce, they all give of themselves to produce the next gen generation. It's in everything that produces, right? That reproduces, yes? Life is built on this principle of giving and the whole planet reveals if you live, you give. This is the principle of life. Can you think of anything in nature though that violates this principle of giving of itself to reproduce and instead takes to reproduce? Viruses. Viruses. This is huge, guys. Get your mind around what a virus does. When a virus infects a host cell, it actually takes over the machinery of that cell. It redirects the, the machinery of the cell to use its energies to produce more and more and more of the virus until it actually depletes the life force within the cell, the energies and the, and the material reserves within the cell. The cell dies, and when the cell dies, it ruptures, spilling virus into the uh, and plasma around it, which infects the cells there, take over the machinery of those cells, and uh, those cells are redirected to produce more and more of the virus, taking, 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 until those cells die, and then they the cells around and so forth. And if this persists, if something doesn't stop it, it only kills the cells, it ultimately kills the host, resulting in death to the virus. This, this, is, this is exactly how sin works. Sin is not giving of self for others. Sin is taking for self. And what, it, what happens is it ultimately is destructive and destroys. Yeah. Well, so other examples that I think are dinner Jason's of the, um, of the earth. And that is like the cowbird also. But the cowbird still gives of itself. It lays the egg. Yeah, but it, it, it takes... It still lays the egg. It, it, it takes away from something else. <laughs> it does. It does. And so what you're seeing with the cowbird, and I thought of these examples too, Wendell, you're seeing now the infection in which God's design has been perverted to a degree, but it still requires part of God's design for it to sustain itself. Yeah, and I think the viruses even, the viruses can't produce themselves. The viruses have to take from some other living organism in order to reproduce itself. And this is what sin does. Sin cannot regenerate anything. It only destroys and corrupts. So yeah, the cowbirds, I think, method has been corrupted. Yeah, it's a good example. There are other animals that do that too, aren't there? So what does this represent? It represents sin, which is the law of sin and death. Paul talks about, in nature, the law of sin and death. And all nature groans under the weight of it. And it's, and it's all, notice, this whole thing we just described is design law stuff. Either in harmony with design or you're deviating from design. Satan has infected human minds with his virus. This false belief is thought distortion. The lesson states, here we see a glimpse of being created in the image of God. So I want to ask you guys, what does it mean to be created in the image of God? How are we in God's image? Any thoughts? We are also creators. Okay, so we have the capacity to procreate. That's a very godly function. Yeah. It's misunderstood today in our planet greatly. Oh, is it misunderstood? M primarily by Christians. Misrepresented constantly in the religious right and the political agenda of the right. This ability to procreate. Yes. The power of choice is probably the most evidence that we have related to the image of God. So power of decision making, and which, which, which when you say power of choice. Love, to be able to love and to rationally choose is something that is unique to humans compared to the other creation yeah. thought processes that we are aware of. Which requires, and you're describing, the function of one of God's design laws to do this, which is the law of liberty or the law of freedom. Genuine freedom exists in God's creation. Yeah, and it's very God. Do we then, when we make powers of choice though, which we have because God has granted us this. I think a very interesting question is, could God create intelligent beings, give them the power to choice without knowing what choices they would make? Either way you answer the question, God is limited. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't think so. I think that's a false question. And I think the ultimate limitation of God is God's love. See, you, the, the question you ask, could he? See, the, the question, when you soon you put a could, could God do? There's certain things God can't do. 
God can't lie. lie. Scripture says he can't lie. He can't do that. He can't be tempted. He can't be tempted by evil, which means he can't act self-centeredly. It's against his nature. He's selfless. But could he create in a way that limits his knowledge of what would happen? Could he choose to limit his own foreknowledge and not look there? It would be no different than you saying, if, um, uh, could you choose not to jump? You have the ability to jump. Could you choose not to? Sure you could. So could he choose not to do that? He has the ability to choose not to do that. Of course. If you have an ability, you can choose not to use it. But that's not the same thing as saying that's what he's done. And the scriptures are pretty clear that he has not done that. If you read scripture and you believe in the Bible prophecy about anything, including the Messiah and what the Messiah would achieve and how he would be treated and how people acted, it required foreknowledge of what people's choices would be when he arrived. Whether it was the foreknowledge of somebody betraying him, the foreknowledge of being put up between two thieves, the foreknowledge of casting lots over his clothing, the foreknowledge of, these are all people's individual free choices that he knew before they committed them and before they chose them. The, uh, the scripture is just rife with this. The, the foreknowledge, the foreknowledge of, of uh, that there would only need to be one ark instead of a fleet of arks at flood. Either he's a fraud and he wasn't really offering everybody a trip on the ark or else he knew that they wouldn't make that decision to get on the ark. So the evidence is overwhelming that God had foreknowledge of men's decisions. But could he? Your question could? Sure, he could have. I just don't believe he did. So what does it mean to make in his image this idea of freedom and liberty? And the question is when you exercise your freedom of decision making, do you exercise your freedom of decision making to represent the divine character or do you exercise your freedom of decision-making to misrepresent it? In other words, do you present truth in love and leave people free, as the New Testament teaches us to do? Or do we believe that we know better and we must use our power of coercive pressure, control the state, to coerce people into conforming their lives to the way we think is best for them? When it comes to matters of conscience. Well, this is out of the book called Education. It says, when Adam came from his creator's hand, he bore in his physical, mental, and spiritual nature. Physical, mental, and spiritual nature. The likeness to his maker. God created man in his own image. And it was his purpose that the longer man lived, the more fully he should reveal this image. The more fully reflect the glory of the creator. All his faculties were capable of development. Their capacity and vigor continually to increase. Now think about that. Their capa What's capacity mean? Abilities. Continually to increase. Do we experience on earth today an ever increasing capacity? No. Or do we experience on earth today a gradual decreasing of capacities? Decrease. It's constantly decreasing. It's constantly, this is the infection of sin. What sin does to God's, God's design was a never-ending increasing of capacities and abilities. So it sounds infinite. It is. I mean, and, and if you want to get a sense on this in, infinite aspect, we are not infinite, we're finite. But in, in a never-ending or an infinite capacity for growth, think about those of you who have people in your, love, in your life that you love. With how much of your heart do you love your children, your first child? With how much of your heart do you love your spouse? With how much of your heart do you love your second child? With how much of your heart do you love your third child? And on and on. In other words, if you say, well, I love my child with all my heart, well, how much is left for the next child? <laughs> you see? And what you find is you love your second child with all your heart and your third child. And it doesn't decrease, does it? In fact, don't you find that the more you love, the more your capacity for love grows? This is part of God's design. We see this still even reflected here. And in fact, when it goes the other direction, when we stop loving, our capacity for love gets restricted. I think our capacity for understanding, the more we understand, the more the puzzle pieces fit together, the more new puzzle pieces make sense and our capacity for understanding reality expands as well. We will never be God and know all things. We will never have infinite um, knowledge, but our capacity for growth, we don't come to an end and say, oh, I've learned. My knowledge bubble is full. I can't learn one more piece of data. 
Well, some I, of us do. <laughs> <laughs> Only in this earth today, because we're under, we have diseases that destroy our capacities and we lose those abilities over time. Yeah. No, but some of us think that we've learned it all. Oh, I see what you're saying. <laughs> oh, with a belief we can come to. We have now, we've, in fact, historically, there were times in history where people wrote, at this time in history, we've learned all there is to know. Right. Yeah. There are people that have written this in history. Yeah, that's a good point. So keep going. It says, vast was the scope offered for their experience. Glorious the field open to their research. The mysteries of the visible universe, the wondrous works of him, which is perfect in knowledge, invited man's study. Face to face, heart to heart communion with his maker was his high privilege. Had he remained loyal to God, all this would have been his forever. Throughout eternal ages, he would have continued to gain new treasures of knowledge, to discover fresh springs of happiness, and to obtain clear and yet clearer conceptions of the wisdom, the power, and the love of God. More and more fully would he have fulfilled the object of his creation, more and more fully have reflected the creator's glory. Notice, more and more fully we grow into it. For what's the object of our creation? To reflect God's glory, to reveal his true character. But by disobedience, this was forfeited. Through sin, the divine likeness was marred and well nigh obliterated. Question, how? How was God's image, how has God's image been nearly obliterated in mankind and in what ways? Okay, so in, first in character, she says, that his image in our character, we are hard-hearted. We're self-centered. We'll exploit people. We will justify. We won't sacrifice self. We'll sacrifice others for self. Selfishness misrepresents God. What else? How about our physical? Do you think that, uh, that today, even the healthiest human being today, if we had the healthiest, you know, whether it's Mr. Universe or whatever, Miss Universe, whatever, we had the healthiest people and we held them up and we actually stood them next to Adam and Eve in, in, right out of the Garden of Eden, would, would they look good? They'd look pathetic, wouldn't they? Mm -hmm. But we're, our minds are darkened. We don't even recognize that. I mean, we, when, you know, as physicians, sometimes we get to see patients with really bad diseases of various kinds. And so we can see the human body and the human being in very deformed states. And we see that. But I think that just walking around, that many of us, you know, as I said many times, I look in the mirror, I'm glad to know this is not as good as the Lord can do. He can do better than this. And it's true. I'm wearing glasses. I got gray hair. I got aches and pains. I got, I mean, my body is not the way God designed it to be. So, phys so character logic, physical, what about relationships? Do our relationships reflect today on earth God's design? They could and they can. And sometimes we see that they do when we see these magnanimous stories sometimes where people have stood up in tragic and terrible threatening circumstances and, and put themselves in harm's way to protect another, to, to give their lives to help another, to, to, to donate an organ to save a life of somebody. We see sometimes these type of love in action, but oftentimes day to day, what do we see? The opposite, where people will exploit to protect exploit others to protect themselves. We see relationships breaking down. We see, you know, child abuse and molestation happening in people's homes where they abuse their own kids. This is not the image of God. <clears throat> Man's physical powers were weakened. His mental capacity was lessened. His spiritual vision dimmed. He had become subject to death, yet the race was not left without hope. Pause. What hope? What do you think our hope would be? Oh, way in the back. Valencian uh, oh, asks me to say this for you. God will never contradict his character of love, thus he will never be selfish. Exactly, exactly. So what do you think our hope is? We're not left, the race was not left without hope. Now this goes, to, how you answer this question reveals immediately what law lens you look through, what model you ascribe to, what you believe the problem with sin is that sin caused, that the plan of salvation was designed to fix. As soon as you answer this question, you're revealing a whole lot about how you see reality around you. What would be necessary to save a species that is now deviant from how God designed it to actually function and operate and live? Does, does Pardon? Restoration to the original. Yes. Does that sound like a legal problem? A courtroom situation? A adjudication? No. So keeping on with the quote. And the question, left without hope, by infinite love and mercy, 
the plan of salvation had been designed, devised and a life of probation was granted. Pause. Before we go on to the next sentence. Probation. Whoa. Wow. Then wait, maybe we're back in a court now. You're on probation. Do we hear that word and you immediately jump to human law room situations here? Oh, we're on probation. We, we're guilty, but we're on probation. Is that how you hear that? Or is it more some other type of meaning to probation? You, you get hired at a new job and your first three months you're on probation. Does it mean something other than a courtroom, a legal process? How do you hear that? Here's the next, next sentence. To restore in man the image of his maker, to bring him back to the perfection in which he was created, to promote the development of body, mind, and soul, that the divine purpose in his creation might be, might, might be realized. Notice again, we're restoring mind, body, and soul. The divine purpose in creation might be realized. This was to be the work of redemption. Does that sound legal to you? It doesn't sound legal, does it? In fact, legal theories of salvation, I'm going to suggest to you, when you hear them, do you, when you hear the legal theories of salvation put out so often, do you immediately think of things like perfecting man's body, mind, and soul and restoring him to God's image? That's what that's teaching me right now. Is that what you hear? I'm going to suggest to you the legal theories of salvation obstruct his true plan. It makes it hard to see. It actually leads people into a false security of believing they have legal accountability of some deeds done in books in heaven when they're not actually even in connection with God's plan to restore in them his design. Love, the basis, continue on with the quote, last paragraph. Love, the basis of creation and of redemption is the basis of true education. What do you hear in that statement? Character change. Yeah, character change. And what kind of law? Is there a law being described? Do you hear law here in this statement? What kind of law? The law of worship? Law of creation? Design law. Protocols upon which reality is built. The principle of giving, which is the principle of love that we already talked about all life. Okay? This is, the pla this is made plain. Next words in the sentence, in the paragraph. This is made plain in the law that God has given as the guide of his life. The first of the great commandments, thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, to love him, the infinite, the omniscient one, with the whole strength and mind and heart means the highest development of every power. It means that in the whole being, the body, the mind, as well as the soul, the image of God is restored. Notice this law that's being described here is not a system of rules to be kept in order to have legal accountability. It is a design protocol in the same way the laws of health work to exercise your muscles, they get stronger. So what does it mean to be in the image of God? It means to love, to give of yourself, to seek the benefit of others, to look outward. Can we have the image of God restored in us without having the law of love restored in us? No, we cannot, no. Can we have God's law of love restored if we cling to the imperialistic law practices that were taught in so many religious circles? I'm going to suggest that we can't. In fact, I'm going to suggest that holding to that old system is what is impairing this organization from filling the message of taking the final message of mercy, its mission of taking the final message of mercy to the world. Amen. So what do you think about this quote? Adam and Eve were formed in God's image. But Satan worked constantly to destroy the divine similitude. The holy pair yielded to the temptation and God's image was obliterated. Christ put his hand a second time to the work. He would recreate human beings. And this is uh, found in Christ's Triumph, page 221. What do you think this means, he would recreate human beings? How? Think this through. Adam and Eve have sinned. The human species is now infected with a, with a terminal condition, a corruption of the design. They're, they're, they're heading towards an eternal death. God, Christ is going to set his hand to the work again to recreate human beings. How's he going to do it? How's he going to achieve this? Is he going to reach down out of the dirt, create a new body out of the dirt, breathe in the nostrils, new the breath of life, and create a new being? Is this how he's going to do it? You all sleep in here today. He sends, he sends his spirit into us to recreate our spirit of worship. And then but we become transformed, as she mentioned before, the, the law of worship. Okay, so if that was necessary, and I'm not disagreeing that the spirit is definitely involved working in our heart, was there something that the spirit actually needed in order for the spirit to be able to access and utilize in order to achieve that? 
we have to be willing to accept it. Our participation, our willingness, what else? A human being and to restore the law into a human brain. There we go. See, if, if we go with just the Holy Spirit working in our hearts, then what's the need of Christ coming? Or was the Christ himself say, it's expedient for you that I go because when I go, the Spirit will come and he will take all that's mine and make it known to you. So the Holy Spirit's actually taking something from Christ to achieve what you've described. Yes? I think there are many things we don't understand, but the degenerate DNA that the human beings have has to be corrected. How is it done? God's way. No question there's many things we don't understand. So many things. I, that, that's really, absolutely. You know, sometimes we, can, we can't say how God works, but he does what is necessary, and it transcends our human understanding. And I think it's so meaningful at times when the disciples, for example, were arguing who's going to be the greatest, he puts a child in the middle of them, and he says, unless you're converted like the child, you'll never get to heaven. A child does not figure out the details. The, the child experiences a relationship in ways that we can't even define. And but Jesus said to his apostles in John, in John 15, 15, I no longer call you servants, rather I call you friends, because servants don't understand their master's business, and I've made everything known to you. So while it is true that we need to have that childlike faith, it's also true Christ has called us to be his understanding friends. And so there's an aspect for us to grow up and comprehend. And I think Jesus really appreciates those of us who want to grow up and comprehend and be intelligent participants with him. But you said something interesting about the DNA. <laughs> to be totally restored, we will have perfect DNA. There's no question about it. When does the Bible say the DNA gets restored? The moment, the twinkling of an eye. When this mortal puts on immortality and this corruption puts on incorruption, we don't get new biology until the second coming. That's, that's for sure. We absolutely, and how God creates new biology, that would be interesting to ask him what method he used to do that. But that's not what we're waiting for here on earth today. That's not what we're promised we get. We said we get a new heart and right spirit. I'll write my law on the inner man. I'll write my law on the heart and mind. I'll circumcise your heart with the, with the Holy Spirit. We get a new, we take the heart of stone out, put it in the heart of flesh. We are reborn, recreated. All these metaphors of scripture are not talking about DNA stuff anymore. If you use a computer metaphor, remember the computer metaphor, the, body the scripture tells us we are body, soma, Soul, psyche, psychiatry, psychology, individuality, software, so hardware, software, and pneuma, panuma, spirit, energy. We are hardware, software, and energy. Body, soul, and spirit. We don't get a new body, new hardware. We don't get hardware upgrades until the second coming. But we can have new software. New minds, new motives, new attitudes, new beliefs, new ways of understanding. A heart that had loves God and loves others. And Revelation actually describes these people still in the bad hardware when it says in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, these are they who do not love their life so much as to shrink from death. Think operationally. Wait a minute. Okay. They don't love their lives so much as to shrink from death. The primary driver in them is no longer survival of the fittest. Watching out for number one, protecting self at all costs. These are people who greater love is no man that he give his life for a friend. That the, the, the operating drive of me first has been rewritten with the operating drive of love for God and others. Transformation of heart. And those who have the transformation of the heart then get the DNA upgrades, the, so the hardware upgrades at the second coming. Yes? Not to, well, but part of the hardware has to be corrected now. Our thought pathways, what we dwell on, how we, how we think, what we find pleasurable is changed. Absolutely. There are neurobiological wiring patterns that happen, but they're happening still in a degraded humanity, not in a perfected humanity, not in a glorified humanity. But, but many people expect that to be a poof, a magical whatever is going to happen whenever we become Christ's children, and yet we have to grow in grace in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior. Absolutely. Other comments on this? This is really profound stuff. What do you expect? Our expectations have a lot to do with our experience and what we get. If you don't expect 
a new heart and right spirit, if you don't expect to have new desires and new motives from a trust relationship with Jesus Christ, if you expect to continue to fall and commit the same behavior patterns of, of fear and distrust over and over again, then there's no victory and we go down the trails that Christianity has been in for the last 2,000 years of seeking various legal solutions through whether it's penance, whether it's um, indulgences, whether it's confessions, whether it's uh, any other types of thing we're looking for. We're looking for something to account for the bad stuff rather than something to transform the person to have a new heart and new motives. And it's our expectations. Do we expect transformation through an indwelling spirit or do we expect no transformation, just legal accountability? Yes. The people in the sea of glass and the neural multiple are described as overcomers. They're not described as forgiven or legally pardoned. And they overcame by? The blood of the Lamb. And the word of their testimony. What does this mean? What is the blood of the lamb? Blood of the lamb is symbolic. This is not red corpuscles. We're not talking, um, you know, drinking, uh, uh, you know, from the, from, the, from the blood bank here. When Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, he's not talking cannibalism. So when we, they ever came about the blood of the lamb, what is it referring to? The life of Christ. The life of Christ. And Christ said it's to, see, what penal substitution theology does, it corrupts our mind to think that the blood application is applied to record books or to courtrooms to pay penalties or to erase records. But Christ said, unless you drink my blood, he's applying it into the heart and mind of the believer. We must internalize the life of Christ. As Peter says, we must be partakers of the divine nature. It's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. This is putting the blood of Christ where it belongs. The life of Christ is internalized into the actual living being. So we hit new hearts and new motives. This is the work of the Spirit that you mentioned earlier, taking what Christ achieved in our behalf and worked out in his humanity and reproducing it in us. This is literal. And if we don't expect it, we don't believe it, we believe it just, then we don't achieve it. We don't experience it. We're not intelligent participants with our, with our creator. Comments? Yes. I was going to say that uh, the marvelous thing is that we have brain plasticity. Yes. And by it, with the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, we can choose certain thought patterns and choices. And that reinforces new neurons development and by neglecting some pathways they get pruned off exactly right it's given us the ability to change this is exactly right third paragraph says the third blessing given to the creation story is the seventh day sabbath here is further confirmation that people are far more than just animals they were created to enjoy fellowship with the creator in ways that none of the other crea creatures can here we see unmistakable evidence of the special place humans have been given in the creation. Jesus underscored this point. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather in the barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? Without devaluing other creatures, he made it clear that people are unique and special on earth. And I think it's true. We need to acknowledge people are unique and special. However, I think we miss something. We move off that, this idea too quickly. For instance, they're, they're citing the Sabbath as evidence the Sabbath itself is evidence of our unique relationship with, with God. Were, were the animals, was the command also given that animals were to rest on the Sabbath? Yes or no? The ox and the ass. Yes, right in, this, right in the commandment. Your animals were to rest on the Sabbath as well. The Sabbath rest was for all of creation, not just for the human creation, not just for the human being. It was for everyone. Now, let me ask you this. Which is a bigger gap? The gap between you and God that gap, or the gap between you and your dog? Which is the bigger gap? Yes. Remember, we are created in God's image. We're animals created for human beings to have relationship with. In, in, inter, interactions with. To understand. To have a, have a have, um, cooperative relationship with. To work together with. Were they? Yes. Yes. Anybody have any pets? And even in this degraded world of sin, can we still have a relationship with animals? Sure. I, I, got a, I heard a Christian comedian. <laughs> he was, he was uh, talking about how 
you know, how our animals love us. And it was really, it was, it was talking about animals and how it's belief animals be in heaven and stuff. And he went on to say, you know what? Your dog loves you more than your spouse. He said, I can prove it to you. Take your spouse and your dog and lock them both in your trunk of your car. Come back in an hour and see which one's glad to see you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's kind of a, a, a silly little, little thing, but you think about it, your dog would be happy. I'm so happy. I'm so happy to see you. <laughs> Spouse, probably not so much. <laughs> but the point here is, our animals do have relations with us. And God's original design, can you imagine? I, and we can't. We really cannot get our mind around how Adam in Eden related to the animals. Because when he rebelled, nature rebelled against his rule. Prior to Adam's rebellion against God, see, as, as God governs his whole universe, the lesson book you described, Adam and Eve were representative of the Godhead on earth. And as all the other ordered of beings, angels and human beings, intelligences throughout the universe, are significantly below the level of God, and they can never fully enter into infinity and interact with God on, on the plane that God exists on, Adam and Eve govern this planet, and they were to govern it in love, but the rest of the animal life on earth are kind of symbolic of all the other life below, beneath the plane of God. And then Adam and Eve were to love them and interact with them and, and enjoy them and share with them and so forth and so on. And they could never enter into the, the, conver the conversation of Adam and Eve and the discussion and planning of Adam and Eve any more than Lucifer could enter into the councils of heaven that Michael could enter into. So there's really profound lessons in all of this. When was the Sabbath given? At the end of creation week. Why? You know, some people, again, they trip up on these things. Is the, is the Sabbath eternal? Meaning, in existence in all eternity past as well as eternity future? Mm -hmm. No, there was, a, there was a starting point for the Sabbath. Why was it not always in existence? Because the controversy was not always in existence. The questions were not always uh, in the minds of intelligent beings. And the answers were not then... Re, uh, the, the answers were not yet uh, requiring evidence to be given. And the Sabbath was given in the context of a war to provide certain answers. But it will exist in eternity future. We're going to move on because we talked about the Sabbath many other times. Um, If we were to govern the earth as God governs the universe and we're created in his image, how are we to treat animals? <clears throat> consider this next quote that I'm going to read to you. This is from My Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 2. And consider it for two things. One, what does it say about our relationship and how we treat animals? But two, think about what, it's, what the understanding and the description it describes for those who mistreat animals and why is it written this way and how do you understand it? So suffering and death were in, entailed because of sin not only upon the human race, but upon animals. Surely then it becomes man to seek to lighten instead of increasing the weight of suffering which his transgression has brought upon God's creatures. He who will abuse animals because it is in, he has them in his power is both a coward and a tyrant. A disposition to cause pain, whether to our fellow man or to the brute cre creation, is satanic. Many do not realize that their cruelty will ever be known because the poor dumb animal cannot reveal it. But could the eyes of these men be opened, as were those of Balaam? They would see an angel of God standing as witness to testify against them in the courts above. A record goes up to heaven, and a day is coming when judgment will be pronounced against those who abuse God's creatures. What do you think first about the description of those who abuse animals as being satanic? Have you ever seen people or been around or had individuals you know that torture animals just to torture them? Do you know this is actually pathology in psychiatry terms? This is your psychopaths. Psychopaths, people who become serial killers, psychopaths, they often have a history in childhood and adolescence of being cruel to animals. They first tor start torturing and killing animals in their adolescence, and then they escalate to killing and uh, torturing humans. This is satanic. It clearly is. This is exactly right. This is antithetical to God's design. What do you think, though, about this way it's described here in the end? An angel 
of God stands witness to testify against them in the courts above. A record goes up into heaven. A day is coming when judgment will be pronounced against those who abuse God's creatures. Why do you think it's written like this? Because there's actually a tribunal in heaven. There's actually a courtroom where we have to keep track of the deeds done and we have to have an, an investigation of the records. We have to have a, a, a judge sit and pronounce judgment and then enforcements of penalties, just like a human law system works, that God runs his diff the government no different than we do. Why is it written this way? What maturity level are the people who abuse animals operating at? What moral maturity level are they operating at? This is level one. This is the most immature maturity. How do you tell what's right and wrong? The people who do this, what's right is when you get a reward. What's wrong is if you get punished. It is the most primitive and basic level of operation. How do you reach people operating at this level? What is it they recognize as authoritative in their world when they're at this level of understanding? One thing and one thing only. Force. Force or power. You have to speak in language of force or power or they don't even pay you any attention. And so it is written in this language, I think first and foremost, because it is trying in a redemptive way to reach people who might be operating at this level. But even though it's written in this level, if you actually have a higher level of understanding, you can actually discern what's said and what's not said. For instance, it didn't say in a legal court. It didn't say that. It said in the courts of heaven. There are royal, royal courts in heaven. And then the royal courts of heaven, the angels stand as witnesses. They're watching what's happening here. It, the record that goes up to heaven, it didn't further define. This author who wrote this, however, and this is, by the way, in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 443, and other places, she writes that there is an accurate record being kept in heaven of your character. Every deed that you do is forming your character and an accurate record of your character development is being kept in heaven. This is back to our computer metaphor. If you have your computer connected to the cloud on a wireless connection and everything you do on your computer, there's a backup on the cloud. It's an accurate record. So if somebody destroys the hard drive, the hardware, you simply get a new machinery download from the cloud your, your software, and you have just resurrected your computer. So yes, there's a record being kept, but the record is being transcribed simply of the character formation of the individuals forming in their acts. It's not a record of deeds, it's who they are. The judgment, what about this judgment pronounced against them? Well, how do you understand judgment? Which law lens? Are you looking through a human law lens? Are you looking through design law lens? What is the judgment of God? It is simply the accurate diagnosis of each character. And it says in Revelation, here's the judgment. Let him who is righteous be righteous still. Let him who is wicked be wicked still. This is my judgment. Your heart is so settled with the seal of God. Your heart is so settled into the truth that no lie can shake you out of it. Your heart and character are so settled into the lie that no truth can break through it. This is the diagnosis. This is the judgment. Monday's lesson, it call, it's entitled Lesson the lesson title is Test at the Tree. Test at the Tree. Talking about the tree of knowledge and good and evil. When you hear about the knowledge, the test at the knowledge of good and evil, what do you hear, test at the tree? What are the possibilities? Well, I'm going to go through these pretty quick. We're running out of time. One, do you think this is what it means? Because God didn't actually know what they were going to do. Thus, God needed a means whereby he could discover what they would do. And thus, he put the test out there so he could find out whether they'd be loyal or not. This is the test. This is what some people think. I think it's clearly not the test. Because God wanted to provide them with means to develop their capacities and solidify their characters. Thus, he provided an opportunity for them to exercise their freedom that was mentioned earlier and make a choice to either solidify their loyalties and beliefs in him or to solidify disloyalty by choosing against him. And only by exercising their freedom could they form their own character. And thus this was an opportunity for them to test their mettle, so to speak. For them to test their resilience, their decision making, their characters, and form one way or the other. Well, this is out of a book called Conflict and Courage, page 33. God might have created man without the power to transgress his law. He might have withheld the hand of Adam from touching the forbidden fruit. But in that case, man would have been not a free moral agent, but a mere automaton. A robot, in other words. 
Without freedom of choice, his obedience would not have been voluntary but forced. There could have been no development of character. It would have been unworthy of man as an intelligent being and would have sustained Satan's charges of an, God's arbitrary rule. As you look at the tree and you think of the tree, what law lens do you look through? Historically, the way I was raised in the church is God has a law. It's an arbitrary law. It was the simplest of all tasks. He just said, don't do it. And, it was, and you either you do or you don't. And, and if you do, well, then you broke his law and justice requires that he punish you. And his punishment is, is immediately seen because he throws them out of Eden. And I, I, I just did the GC. I was talking to people who still think this way. And they told me that, that in Eden it was punishment because God threw them out of the garden and that was punishment for sin. This is all imposed law construct stuff and it comes from believing Satan's lie that God's law works no differently than what a created being works. Come back to seeing God as creator, worship him who made the heavens and the earth and you understand design law stuff and you understand something different, is entire, entirely different is going on. Because the law that's in operation in Eden is the law of exertion. That strength comes from exercise. Adam and Eve had to exercise their abilities, their powers of choice in order for them to solidify their characters in truth. You get the same argument with the Sabbath. You know, the tree was an arbitrary test. The Sabbath is an arbitrary weekly test. And if, if you, and again, this quote says this is, this is a satanic argument. Satan's allegation is that God's arbitrary. So they teach the idea that, that, that God threw them out of the garden as punishment is horribly wrong because it represents God's actions to not be actions of love or grace or mercy or redemption, but that of a brutal dictator and stern drudge. In reality, God threw them out of the garden for redemptive and mercy purposes. Why? Think about it. What would have happened on earth in the context of hearts and minds that operate like sinful people operate? Self-centeredness, egocentrism, exploiting others. If on earth today the tree of, knowledge, the tree of life was still on earth and people could access it. Who do you think would control it? The kind people, the good people, the merciful people, the people who wouldn't kill to get their way? Bad. Yes, and so would suffering and pain and sin have been reduced on earth had the tree of life been left on the earth? Increased. It would have increased pain and suffering and exploitation terribly. Thus, the act to put him out of the garden was not an act of punishment for sin. It was a therapeutic intervention to reduce pain and suffering and death and torment and exploitation on this earth. But that only happens if you can actually get your mind around design law. Review in Herald, May 23, 1912. Strength comes by exercise. All who put to use the ability that God has given them will have an increased ability to devote to his service. Those who do nothing in the cause of God will fail to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the kingdom. If a man should lie down and refuse to exercise his limbs, he would soon lose all power to use them. Thus the Christian who will not use his God-given powers not only fails to grow up in Christ, but loses the strength which he already had he becomes a spiritual paralytic. This is the law of exertion happening. This is design law stuff. This is not imposed law. This is not some system of rules that requires a judicial magistrate to examine and, and enforce. Thus our creator God provided the simplest of means for them to simply make a simple choice and thus strengthen their characters, grow in godliness, become more solidified in their loyalty. Instead, they went the other direction. I'm going to jump a little bit. Um, Wednesday's lesson uh, talks about Eve became overwhelmed by her senses. The tree was beautiful. She sank her teeth into the fruit. Eve imagined that uh, she entered into a higher state of existence when she shared her experience with Adam. Her eyes were open, but they were embarrassed by what they saw. Genesis 3, 7 says, Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. What are the possible meanings of this idea? Their eyes, they realized they were naked. Their robes of light were gone and they saw that their bodies were not covered. One possible meaning. How about the pure hearts? Their pure hearts were gone and they were conscious of guilt and shame and became self-focused, thus noticing they were naked. How about... Under conviction of their own consciences, they experienced fear and became self-focused and afraid, and their souls' characters were naked. Their souls' characters were naked and open without excuse. 
But this was displaced onto their bodies and they tried to cover their bodies to, to cover the shame of their souls. When, they opened, when their eyes were opened, what do you think they saw? Their eyes were open. What did they see? Did they look around the world and see all types of disease, defect, fungating lesions, disgusting, horrible, revolting things? Did they see this? No. Did they see imperfection? When their eyes were opened, they, yes, they saw imperfection, but not in the objective world. Where did the, why did they see imperfection? Because the the lenses in their own minds had been warped and they filtered what they saw through their own guilt and shame because the imperfection was in their operating system now. They processed information through a certain lens and they saw imperfection not because God created imperfection but because their minds were now imperfect. This, is, this will give you insight into when Jesus said to Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. But the Bible says when Jesus comes, all those who pierced him will see him. Or Jesus himself said, Though, when you see me next, I will be sitting at the right hand of, the, of uh, glory when you see me next. So, so Jesus in, in Revelation says that the wicked will see him in his glory. But Jesus said to Nicodemus that unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of heaven. What they see is they see his power. And it terrifies them and they're afraid and they think he's like Satan says and, and they run and hide because they're terrified he's going to kill. What they don't see is they don't see the kingdom of love. They don't see his character of grace. They don't see his mercy. They don't see the, the heartbreak in, in, in him that, that he's coming back and, and his own children are, are afraid of him and running from him. They don't see this at all because their minds are corrupt. If it was just a robe of light, you would think that Eve's robe of light would have left her as she went to see Adam, and there would be more than just an apple that he would notice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and on that, <laughs> that, that does go back to the question that we do know back, we're, we'll close with what we started on. And what we started on was, how do we, it said fairly early in Earth's history, and I, I got off on the aspect that it wasn't early in the inorganic history, it was early in the organic history of Earth that sin happened. And how do we know it was fairly early in the organic history? Because God gave them the direction and or permission and or instruction to be fruitful and multiply in a perfect world. And yet, no children were on the scene by the time they sinned. So it was at least, in my view, less than nine months. <laughs> So, the gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are a God of love, a God of goodness, a God who has created the universe to operate in harmony with your character, and you are always faithful, reliable, consistent. Lord, we ask that your spirit will come and take all that Christ has achieved in our behalf that we could never achieve for, on our own, and reproduce it in our hearts and minds that we might be partakers of your divine nature, having hearts that love you and others more than self, and we might witness this, this truth that your church might awaken out of its slumber that the world can be lighted with the knowledge of your character and that you will come soon. We pray in your holy name. Amen.